that uh, little epistle near the end of the Bible, 1 John chapter 5. I think that most of you that are with us on Sunday mornings know that we have been going through this little book of 1 John. It's only five chapters long, and so we are coming near the end of it. 1 John chapter number 5, you know that the Apostle John wrote it, wrote it about 90 A.D., and uh, it's really been a great little book. It's been great for me to study through it, learn some things I didn't know before. I trust that's true for you. I'd like us to read uh, together two verses. First John chapter number 5, verse 5 and verse 6. Again, First John chapter number 5. If we could read together, reading out loud, verse 5 and verse 6. Let's begin there in verse number 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this freedom that we enjoy to set things aside, uh, to begin a brand new week, gathering with other Christians and Lord, I pray to help us this morning as we are now nearing the end of this little book of 1 John. Lord, we don't want to race just to get it done. There's still so much good to learn from it. Help us this morning as we look at this truth. Lord, would you direct my thoughts, my words, fill me with your spirit. May this be helpful to each of us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I've said it many times, and I trust you can see it in your sleep, but the theme of 1 John is ways that you can know that you're saved. I uh, was speaking to that visiting family that was here with us last Sunday morning, and I talked to them about their salvation, and they said, yes, they're saved. And I said, you know, I preached a series. Of course, they were here last Sunday. But if the only way that you know that you're saved is because you can look to a day and an hour when you bowed your head and asked Jesus to save you. If that is the only way that you know that you're saved, then you have reason to question that. You should check it further. First John, in 1 John, John gives us, and to this point, he's given us 12 different tests that you can know that you're saved. And I know I've given them before, but first text, test is a doctrinal test. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Second is a moral test. Do you acknowledge that you were a sinner and that you needed a Savior? The third is a walk test. Since you got saved, have you walked a different walk? Fourth one is a love test. Do you love the fellowship of God's people? Fifth one is a spirit test. Does the Holy Spirit indwell in you six tests is a demonstrated love test it's one thing to say you love christians how do you demonstrate that seventh test is a heart test does god convict your heart the eighth test is a prayer test do you pray do you see answers to prayer the ninth test is a spirit world test do you recognize that there are spirits behind the scenes there are God's spirit and those spirits, but they're also unclean. There is a spirit world. The world would laugh at that. Christians understand that. The tenth test is standing up for Christ. Test: Do you take a stand for Christ? Eleventh test is a loving God test. And if you remember last test, or rather last week, we looked at this idea that as a Christian, you can overcome this world. Now, folks, before we got saved, this world just swallowed us up. We were just falling to this world's actions and this world's attitude, this world's agenda. But, you know, we found out last week, and we looked there at uh, 1 John. Look, if you would, 1 John 4 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, the last part of that verse, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Of course, if you're saved, it's the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. So that verse says that the Spirit of God that's inside of you is greater than the powers that run this world. But that is no guarantee that you and I are going to have victory. That has to be appropriated. So we looked last time at the overcoming Christian. 
Pastor, what are we looking at today? Well, in our next section, which runs from verse 6 to verse 10, there is a word that shows up five times. So God has already made it clear what the theme of these next verses. See if you can figure it out, 1 John, beginning in chapter 5 and verse 6. The Bible says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Look there at verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one, verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. Then verse 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Now, it's pretty obvious. The word that keeps showing up is witness, 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 witness. Pastor, what is a witness? A witness is somebody who has seen something or somebody that has heard something and they can recall those things and they are able to tell somebody else what they saw or what they heard. That's a witness. Sometimes when the Bible talks about you and I being a witness for Jesus Christ, Talking about the fact that when we go out in this lost world, we need to open our mouth and tell other people what Jesus Christ has done for us, that he went to the cross at Calvary, died for our sins, that we accepted Jesus' payment for our sins. The Bible says that we are to be a witness. It says in Acts 1.8, I know it's a familiar verse, uh, Jesus said to his apostles just before he ascended back to heaven, Jesus said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Sometimes when the Bible talks about a witness, it's talking about you and I as Christians telling others what Jesus Christ has done for us. But that's not the, the, the definition of the word witness here in 1 John chapter 5. You know that if you've ever gone to a court of law and someone is charged with some kind of crime. When someone is charged with a crime and they try to defend themselves, and I, I, I'm an honest, upstanding citizen, and uh, the judge is looking for somebody to verify that, and so they bring up witnesses onto that witness stand. And that witness verifies what he's seen and what he's heard to verify, again, that this person is an honest and upstanding citizen. Sometimes a witness is what you and I as Christians are commanded to do out in this world. But sometimes a witness is proof to verify something that's being claimed. And that's exactly what this witness is here in verse number 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Look again at verse 6, now that you know where we're going with this witness. Verse number 6, 1 John 5 and verse 6, it says, This is he, he's talk, talking about Jesus Christ, that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness. That statement is saying that the Spirit of God bears witness that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what that's saying. There in verse number 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So again, that's somebody that is bearing witness to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse number nine, if we receive the witness of men. So if men tell us that Jesus is the Son of God, keep reading, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. Again, verse 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. So all of these things are pointing to the fact that when we say Jesus is the Son of God, this world, listen, the people that walked on this earth during Jesus' day, some of them called Jesus a liar. 
Some of them called Jesus a fake. Some of them called Jesus a phony. So when we tell people that you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and they say, why? Well, because Jesus is the Son of God who says. Folks, if it's only you and I that say Jesus is the Son of God, this world has a perfect right to say, I'm not going to believe it just because you say it. Who are the witnesses that verify that Jesus is the Son of God? And so that's what our text that we're looking at, verse 6 to 10, is all about. If you're taking notes this morning, I know that many of you do. My title is The Witnesses of Who Jesus Is. The Witnesses of Who Jesus Is. Do you know in our text, this word witness, uh, it's not reminding us, it's not the purpose of that word showing up here, that we need to be telling others that they need to trust Christ. This word witness, uh, instead is talking about the fact that when this lost world that we tell they need to trust Christ, when they say, why? What makes Jesus any different than anyone else Folks, that's a fair question. If you're the only one that is a witness of who Jesus is, then they have a right to be a skeptic. You know, way back there, keep your hand in 1 John, of course we're going to need, but look if you would in Deuteronomy chapter number 19. Deuteronomy chapter number 19. Deuteronomy chapter number 19, God established a truth. Again, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 19, and look if you would in verse number 15. Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15, God is giving this law to Moses to give to Israel. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin and any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established way back, way back 3,500 years ago. God had established a principle that you can't accuse someone, you can't find them guilty, if all that you have is one witness. You have to find two to the degree, you have to find three to the degree. That was established way back in the Old Testament. And as you continue through the scriptures, we find that truth verified. Again, you can let go to Deuteronomy. Look there, if you would, in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, of course, that's the very first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter number 18, this is talking about instructions of a church problem. Someone in a, in a church is creating some kind of a problem. How do you deal with that? Well, look there in Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 15. Matthew 18 and verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he shall not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So again, God has repeated this truth that it takes two or three witnesses to verify that something is true. Look, if you would, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter number 13. And so it's not enough for one person to say this so. It's not enough for just one person to say, I believe this. Because if there's only one person that says that, this world has a right to say, you want me to believe it just because you believe it? Who else believes this? Again, 2 Corinthians chapter number 13 and verse number 1. Paul says, this is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now, what's Paul saying? Paul went to the city of Corinth on his second missionary journey. That was the first time he spoke to these people. The second time that Paul communicated with these people is the book of 1 Corinthians. The third time that Paul is communicating God's truth to these people is 2 Corinthians, 
And that's why it says in 2 Corinthians 13, this verse 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Paul, why is that so important? He says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I'm just trying to say if the only witness that's given to this world that Jesus is the Son of God, it's not enough. And they have right to say, I don't believe it. I think it's all nonsense. And so it's going to take several witnesses. Pastor, who are the witnesses that are declaring that Jesus is the Son of God? That's where we're going. I think many of you are aware of the fact that there's all kinds of cults in this world. Incidentally, the mark of a cult is the fact that their doctrine of Jesus Christ is wrong. For instance, there is a group called Jehovah Witnesses. And they even got their name in there, Witness. So they are claiming that what they are saying is verifying what Jehovah said. So whatever God said, the Jehovah's Witness are saying, we are saying to you the same thing that God said. But you know, if you check what Jehovah's Witness are saying to people, what they're saying is a lie. What they're saying to people is not what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. Uh, for instance, so I say, preacher, I thought Jehovah's Witness do believe that. Well, Jehovah's Witness believe that Jesus is a small God. He's not a big God, capital G. Do you know if you were to pin a JW down, they would say Jesus was mighty, but he was not the almighty. If you were to ask a JW and they were honest, they'd say Jesus didn't live in eternity past. They would say he at some point in time was created. That's what a JW teaches. JW would say that Jesus is not really a member of the Trinity. They would say that Jesus, uh, as a son, during his pre-human state, he was really just an angel, and his name as an angel was Michael. And you say, maybe you've never heard of these things before, but that's what they're saying of Jesus Christ. They're saying Jesus was a created being sometime in the past, and when he finally was born in Bethlehem, the Spirit of God came down upon this man, Jesus, and then he became a spirit man, and when he got to the cross of Calvary, that spirit left him, and so when he died on the cross, he wasn't really God dying for our sins. Pastor, that is craziness, and yet they call themselves Jehovah Witnesses. They're not a witness at all of who Jesus Christ is. And so here's where we're going. When we try to tell people that you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, they have a right to say why. And we say because Jesus is the Son of God. Who else says that? Is it just you that says that? And maybe in your witnessing, you have bumped into that exact same thing, where a skeptic says, I'm not going to believe it just because you tell me. So again, we're going to chase this thought through, and we'll finally end up back there in 1 John again. But uh, look, if you would, uh, John chapter 20. Now, this is the gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter number 20. Preacher, who are the witnesses of who Jesus is? Who else besides you, Pastor Carlson, and me, who else besides us is testifying that Jesus is the Son of God? John chapter 20. John chapter number 20, and look at verse 31. John chapter 20 and verse 31. The Bible says, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. We've been in 1 John. I'm trying to say it slowly so I don't confuse you. We've been in 1 John for quite a while. And the theme of 1 John, I've already said it, is ways that you can know that you're saved. That's the theme of 1 John. 
Pastor, what is the theme of the Gospel of John? That's where we're looking right now. What is the theme of the Gospel of John? We find it in John 20 and verse 31. Look at it again. John 20 and verse 31, but these are written, that's the Gospel of John, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Do you know if you read the Gospel of John, time and time again it drives this truth home that Jesus is the Son of God. And so again, if you're taking notes this morning, we're chasing down the witnesses of who Jesus is. And the very first witness of who Jesus is is the entire Gospel of John. You know, when we lead someone to Christ, many of us say, you need to start reading your Bible where? Start reading in the Gospel of John. Pastor, why is it so important to go there, to get a new convert to read there? Because it will repeatedly confirm in their minds and their hearts that Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, that's what John said the reason for writing the Gospel of John is. That you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You know that there are four Gospel books in our Bible. There's Matthew, and there's Mark, and there's Luke, and there's John. All four of those gospel books tell us about the public life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And each one describes Jesus Christ just a little bit differently. Matthew describes Jesus as the coming king. Mark describes Jesus as the humble servant. Luke describes Jesus as the perfect man. But John describes Jesus as the Son of God. And through the entire 21 chapters of this Gospel of John, time and time again we are reminded that Jesus is the Son of God. Again this morning we are chasing down the witnesses of who Jesus is. And the very first witness of who Jesus is is the entire Gospel of John. Look there in John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. And I know that we have seen some of these, but uh, in light of where we're aiming this morning, look at John chapter number 1. Notice how it begins. John chapter 1 and verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. And the Word, capital W, was with God. And the Word was God. You and I already know where that's going, but it talks about that there was somebody with God and there was somebody that was God way back in the beginning. Say, so who is that word, Pastor? Look at verse 14, John 1, verse 14. The Bible says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and truth. That word is Jesus Christ. And notice that, that Jesus Christ, it says, was God. Jesus is not just a man. Jesus was not just a good man. Jesus was not just a healer. Jesus was not just a teacher. Jesus was not just a prophet that came upon this earth. Jesus is the Son of God. And we find that throughout this entire Gospel of John. Uh, look there at John 1 verse 4 as it continues to describe this word. Capital W, verse number 4, John 1 verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Again, we've already seen in verse number 14 that that word became flesh. And so I say the first thing, I say, preacher, who are the witnesses of who Jesus is? The very first witness is the entire gospel of John. Look there in John chapter 5. It's, it's true that we not only learn that truth from the gospel of John, but folks, we learn that truth from the entire scriptures. Look there in John chapter 5 and verse 39, Jesus said this, John 5 and verse 39, search the scriptures. For in them ye think that ye have eternal life, 
and they are they which testify of me. Do you know, as we read the scriptures, as we search the scriptures, particularly the Gospel of John, but anywhere in the scriptures, it continues to verify that Jesus is the Son of God. And so when a skeptic says to you, do you expect me to believe that Jesus is the Son of God only because you say it? Our answer is no. No, 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 no. Don't just listen to me. Read the scriptures. Read the Gospel of John. That's another witness. I give you a second witness. Look there in John chapter 1 and verse number 6. Not only do we have the witness of the entire Gospel of John, but John chapter 1, look there if you would in verse number 6. Again, John chapter 1 and verse 6. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, we've talked about the Apostle John. The Apostle John was the one that wrote the Gospel of John, later the Epistle of John. But that's not who John chapter 1 verse 6 is talking about. Look at it again. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. You know that John the Baptist came on the scene. His public ministry began six months before Jesus' public ministry we know that John the Baptist was a witness. He was a voice in the wilderness. People couldn't understand him. He dressed different. He ate different. You say, well, preacher, why did John the Baptist come on the scene? Why was it so important that John the Baptist have his ministry before Jesus' ministry? Well, it tells us there, and look in verse 7, John 1, verse 7. The same, that's John the Baptist, came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now, the light wasn't John the Baptist. The light was Jesus Christ. But we find there in verse number 7 that the reason that John the Baptist came on the scene was he was to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. So you've already written down as far as the witnesses of who Jesus is. First witness is the entire gospel of John. The second witness of who Jesus is, is the testimony of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, when he came, you know he began to preach. We know that John's ministry began six months before Jesus' ministry. And as John stood on the shores of the Jordan River, he preached that people needed to repent. He announced that the Messiah, the Christ, was coming. They better prepare themselves for the Messiah's coming and look there, if you would, in John chapter 1 and verse 15. John bear witness, that's John the Baptist, bear witness of him who Christ, and crying, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Stop right there. Hold on a minute. Pastor, you said that John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus, and that's true. Well, if John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus, then how could John the Baptist say what we just read in verse 15? Look at the last part of the verse. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He wasn't physically before John the Baptist, but Jesus was eternally before John the Baptist. John is declaring that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the eternal, immortal Son of God. Look at the next verse, verse 16. And of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John is declaring in verse 15 that Jesus was long before I ever came on this earth. Jesus already was. He's eternal. Verse number 18, John is declaring that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. 
I know that this is so basic, but when we tell people you need to trust Jesus as your Savior, why? Well, because he's the Son of God. Who besides you says that? Well, first of all, the entire Gospel of John says that besides the entire Scriptures. Second one that's a witness of who Jesus is is the testimony of John the Baptist. And just in case we miss that, look there in John chapter 1, verse 29. John 1 and verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Not on the earth, John. You were before him on the earth. Yeah, but Jesus is the eternal Son of God. Look again, John 1 verse 35. John 1, verse 35, again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, saith, Behold the Lamb of God. I say to you, the first witness of who Jesus is is the entire Gospel of John. The second witness of who Jesus is is the testimony of John the Baptist. So when a skeptic says, Do you expect me to believe that Jesus is the Son of God just because you said, Oh, no. Don't believe it because I say it. The entire Gospel of John says it. And not only does the entire Gospel of John say it, but also the testimony of John the Baptist, a contemporary in Jesus' own day, he says it. I give you a third one. Look there in John 1 and verse 33. Again, we're trying to chase down the witnesses of who Jesus is. Folks, we're not talking through our hat. When we say Jesus is the Son of God, we are but one of many witnesses. The third one is John chapter 1 and verse 33. Again, John 1 verse 33. And this is John the Baptist, and I knew him not, but he that, was, uh, that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. They're pressing John the Baptist. The critics of John the Baptist are pressing him. Who are you? They're saying, John, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? Are you the one that we're waiting for? And John said, no, not me. He said, I am not the Christ. In fact, he said, when the Christ comes, I am not even worthy to unloose the latchets of his sandals. No, I'm not the Christ. And they say, well, if you're not the Christ, where is he? If you were sent before him to announce that he was coming, then where is he? And John said, all that I can tell you is the one who called me, that's God. It's the one who sent me, that's God. It's the one who told me to go before the Messiah as a voice in the world. The one who called John the Baptist is God. Having said that, look at verse 33 again. John 1 verse 33, and I knew him not. John says, I, I didn't know who Christ was. But he that sent me to baptize with water, well, it's God that sent him to baptize with water, the same said unto me. So God spoke to John the Baptist. God said something to John the Baptist. What did God say to him? Uh, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. John saw it happen. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. But John saw when he baptized the Lord Jesus Christ, John saw that spirit descending upon Jesus Christ just as God had told him it would happen. Do you know the third witness of who Jesus is, is the clear statements of God the Father. The clear statements of God the Father. 
And how many times in the scriptures do we read of God clearly saying, this is my beloved son. Look there, you can let go of John, we'll be right back, so keep that if you would, but look there in Matthew chapter number 3. Matthew chapter 3, a, a, a fuller explanation of the baptism of Jesus is found in Matthew 3. Look there in Matthew chapter number 3. And look there in verse number 13. Matthew 3 and verse 13. The Bible says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John, John the Baptist, to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And so John is baptizing people. John's preaching, John the Baptist, preaching repentance, preaching that the Messiah is going to come and you need to repent, you need to get your hearts right, and if you have gotten your hearts right, as an outward demonstration of that, you need to come forward and get baptized. And So John is baptizing people who have declared that they have repented and got there. That's John the Baptist. And as John the Baptist is baptizing and preaching and baptizing and preaching, as John the Baptist is doing that, Jesus Christ himself steps up. And instantly, God reveals to John, this is the one. And so Jesus walks up and says, I need to be baptized too. John said, oh, no, you don't. I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And so that's what's happening here in Matthew chapter number 3. Keep reading there, Matthew chapter 3. Verse number 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. You know, that's the third clear statement. And it's a clear statement of God the Father. God said, this is my son. God not only did that clear statement in Matthew 3, look if you would Matthew 17. And again, I know we're turning to a lot of places, but if it's an honest skeptic that comes to you and says, why should I believe that Jesus is the Son of God just because you tell me? Oh, no. I don't want you to believe it because I say it. I want you to believe it because the scriptures say it. The whole gospel of John says it. I want you to believe it because it's what John the Baptist said. I want you to believe it because it's what the God the Father said. Not only did God the Father said, this is my beloved son. God the Father testified that Jesus was his son. Here in Matthew chapter 17, we hope, look there in Matthew 17, verse number 1. Bible says, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them, with him. Verse 4, then Peter, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Verse 5, while he yet spake. So God interrupted Peter. While he yet spake. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. We've looked at two places very clearly that God has stated, this is my son. And so again, when a, a skeptic says, do you expect me to believe that Jesus is the son of God just because you say it he is? Our answer is no. The whole gospel of John says that he is. And the truth is, the whole scripture says he is. But John the Baptist said he is. God the Father said Jesus was his son. Don't believe me. 
Now, folks, besides you and me telling it, we've already got three witnesses. We only need two or three. But the Bible doesn't stop there. Look again at John chapter 1 and verse 33. We aren't limited to believe who Jesus is solely by what the Apostle John wrote, solely by what John the Baptist said, solely by what God the Father stated, but we're given a fourth witness of who Jesus is. John chapter 1 and verse number 33. I know we just read it, but we're getting another witness in the same verse. John the Baptist said, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Could I say the fourth witness of who Jesus is, is the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. The confirmation of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's pretty close to what I just said, but God the Father said to John the Baptist, one of these days, my son is going to show up. And when my son shows up, the Holy Spirit is going to descend upon my son. And so John is all eyes. <laughs> John is wondering, is it going to happen today? Is it going to happen today? Is it the next day? Is it going to happen... John's waiting for a witness to confirm who Jesus is. And so, again, John's baptizing, and Jesus steps up, and God the Father says, that's the Messiah. If John had any questions, in spite of what God had told John, when John baptized Jesus Christ and Jesus came out of that water and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus Christ, folks, that's the fourth witness of who Jesus is. Again, if you're taking notes this morning, the fourth witness of who Jesus is is the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. You would keep your hand there in John chapter 1, but look at Matthew 3 and verse 16 again. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. Again, by the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus Christ. That was a confirmation, a fourth one now. That was a fourth witness of the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Look again in Matthew 3 and verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. That must have been a thought. <laughs> that must have been something to see. And if John had any questions, he didn't have any questions after that. You know, when a skeptic says, do you, believe, do you want me to believe that Jesus is the Son of God just because you tell me? No, don't believe it because I tell you. Believe it because the Scriptures, particularly the Gospel of John. Believe it because John the Baptist said Jesus was the eternal Son of God. Believe it because uh, God the Father made it clear so many times, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased Believe it because of the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. I give you a fifth one. Look there in John chapter 5. John chapter number 5. Look at verse number 36. John chapter 5 and verse 36. If those four witnesses weren't enough already. John 5 and verse 36. Jesus said, but I have a greater witness than that of John. So again, people were skeptical about who Jesus was, and they knew who Jesus claimed he was, but they were skeptical, John 5, 36. But I have a greater witness than that of John. So there is even something more powerful than what John the Baptist told you about me. I have a greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me. If you're taking notes, the fifth witness of who Jesus is is the mighty works that Jesus did on this earth. It's his miracles. His miracles. 
We know that when Jesus walked the earth, he fed the hungry. And we're not just talking about one or two. We're talking about thousands upon thousands Jesus miraculously fed. There's no human being that ever could or did do that. His miracles attest to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. When Jesus was on the earth, he healed the sick. And not anything like, keep your hand there on John, look at Matthew chapter number 8. Uh, when Jesus healed people, it wasn't, you know, some internal disease that no one could check out. We hear a lot about these faith healers. And uh, they, they apparently heal all kinds of people. And you can't check them out. I mean, they say, well, I had an ulcer. Well, you couldn't prove they had one before, and you can't prove that it's gone now. That's many of the claims that some of these fake healers are trying to convince us with. Jesus had nothing of the sort. It wasn't just internal diseases. Jesus laid his hands upon blind people. And they even brought the parents of this blind son. He said, is this your son? Was he born blind? And they say, yes, yes, he was. He was He's been blind for 40 years. That's the kind of healing that Jesus could do. Look there in Matthew chapter 8, if you would. Matthew chapter number 8, and look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife mother laid, uh, sorry, his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. You can't make up a fever just like that disappearing. It was a work that Jesus did. Look at verse 16, Matthew 8, verse 16. When the even was come, they, that's the, the city people, people in town, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the devils with his word, and he healed, notice the next word, all that were sick. You don't ever hear of faith healers today doing anything of the sort. They'll claim one or two and, and, and uh, somebody who's really sick who actually thinks they actually could get healed. They'll get in some long line in hopes that they too will be healed. And after that faith healer has healed one or two with some internal problem, shuts it down and say, folks, come back tomorrow. Maybe we'll do a little more. It, it's fake. It's phony. You say, Pastor, you, get, you sound like you're hot on the collar. Do you know, when someone has been sick for years and years and years and years and tried everything, and they're told that there's a faith healer, even if they're ahead, tells them this guy's a liar, their heart says, it's worth a try. Jesus' works weren't phony. They weren't fake. He fed thousands and had more leftovers than when he started. That was a miracle. Jesus healed entire crowds when he came through a town. That was a miracle. I'm saying that the fifth witness to who Jesus is, is the mighty works that Jesus did on this earth. We know that he cleansed the lepers, sometimes two at a time, sometimes ten at a time. Who but God could do that? We know that he gave sight to the blind. We know that Jesus helped the crippled to walk again. He even raised the dead to life again. Again, Jesus' friends called those works miracles. In fact, when Nicodemus came to Jesus that night in John chapter 3, Nicodemus said, no man can do these miracles that thou doest. He said, only God could do that. You expect me to believe that Jesus is the Son of God just because you said, no, 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 no. The scriptures, just read the scriptures, particularly the gospel of John. That should convince you. If that's not enough, read what John the Baptist said about Jesus Christ. That should convince you. If that's not enough, read the clear statements that God the Father 
He said, this is my beloved son. If that's not enough, the Holy Spirit confirmed that Jesus was a son of God. If that's not enough, the mighty works that Jesus did. You know, when the Lord was 12, we read this in Luke 2 that Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple. And of course, they did their thing in the temple and they headed back, but Jesus stayed we know that Joseph and Mary, when they realized Jesus wasn't with them, they went back to Jerusalem. They finally found Jesus in the temple, and they were a little upset, and he said, Wist you not that I must be about my father's business? Jesus knew the works that he was going to be required to do by his heavenly father. We know that Jesus, in the middle of his ministry, said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, said, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And I'm saying to you that it's Jesus' works that's the fifth witness of who Jesus is. Folks, we're, we're, not, we're not just following some some fairy tale that, 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 that somebody with some golden glasses somehow got, that's Mormonism, these glasses that somebody got so they could read some tablets and they were told some news and lo and behold the tablets can't be found anymore and the glasses are gone too but you just need to believe what Joseph Smith tells you is true. That is baloney. You have as much right to ask, what are the other witnesses for what you're saying? On that same count, when we tell this lost world that you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and they say, hold on a minute, why? Because Jesus Christ is the Son of God who else can be a witness to that statement? This world has a right to ask that question. We've already seen five. I give you a sixth witness that we find in the scriptures. Look there, if you would, at John chapter 15. John chapter number 15 and verse 27. John chapter 15 and verse 27. Look there, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. John 15, 27, Jesus says to them, And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And Jesus is just here getting ready to be arrested, to be tried, to be crucified, to be buried and rise again, 40 days later ascend back to heaven. And before the busyness of what's about to happen, Jesus gathers with his apostles, and Jesus said, you are going to bear witness of me. If you're taking notes, the sixth witness of who Jesus is is the proclamation of the first century followers. The proclamation of the first century followers. I know there were crowds that were with Christ when he was in public. But Jesus said to his apostles, you've been with me in private. You have seen how I act when no one else is around. You have seen what I do when no one else is here. And I want you to go proclaim to this lost world who you know that I am. He told them that in John 15 and verse 27. Well, preacher, did they actually do that? Well, look at the very next chapter, John chapter 16 and verse 30. John chapter 16 and verse 30, the Bible says, uh, Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee, but, but by this we believe that thou comest forth from God. That's his disciples. And they are declaring that Jesus Christ came from God. And a skeptic says, do you expect me to believe that Jesus is the Son of God just because you say it? Oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't believe me because I say it. You need to believe the Scriptures, particularly the Gospel of John. You need to believe what God the Father 
Sorry, you need to believe what John the Baptist said. And you need to believe what God the Father has said. And you need to believe how the Holy Spirit confirmed all of that. You need to look at the mighty works that Jesus did. No one has ever done those kind of things. Certainly never to the magnitude that Jesus did. And you need to pay attention to the proclamation of what those first century followers said. And, and we don't have time to it, but the book of Acts. Peter said in Acts 3, Unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, Peter, everywhere he preached, said, Jesus is the Son of God. Do you know Paul, the Bible says in straight way, he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. I gave you the last one. He said, Pastor, we finally got the last one back in 1 John. That is where we started, isn't it? 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter 5. Now, I've given you six witnesses of who Jesus is. We considered first of all the scriptures, the entire gospel of John. That's a witness of who Jesus is. Secondly, the testimony of John the Baptist. Third, the clear statements of God the Father. Fourth, the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. Fifth, the mighty works that Jesus did on this earth. Sixth, the proclamation of his first century followers. But I give you the last one. Look there in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6. This is he, speaking of Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Previous verse, verse 5, Jesus the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Do you know, I have been saved for a long time. <laughs> I've been saved in 1972. That makes me saved for 51 years. I've probably read 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 almost 50 times. And I have to be honest, folks, I don't, I don't understand every verse of the Bible. And that 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6 is on my list of verses that I had no idea what it meant. Well, now I have to preach it. <laughs> and when you're a preacher and you're asked to preach something you have no idea, that really puts you in a bind. And it's like, Lord, what do we do with this? I mean, it's talking now about three things together. Try this out. Three things together are a seventh witness of who Jesus is. Let's look at it again. First John chapter 5 and verse 6. This is he, speaking of Jesus Christ, that came by water and blood. Even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. So somewhere, somehow the Spirit and water and blood makes up yet one more witness. Say, preacher, what do you do when you hit a text you don't know what to do? <laughs> oh, you start by praying and you keep reading. Look at verse 8. In case you miss it, those three are a witness. Verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Somehow the spirit and the water and the blood together make a seventh witness. I started picking up some commentaries. Commentaries like teachers, they give you some insight that maybe you'd never consider before. And uh, some of the commentaries say that's a reference to the death of Jesus Christ. And they say that because, you know, when Jesus hung on that cross and uh, after so many hours, we know that Jesus died. But those soldiers were sent to come along and break the legs of those three on the crosses so that they would die quicker, so their legs couldn't push them up to get oxygen into their lungs. And so sure enough, they break the legs of the one thief and they break the legs of the other thief. But they come to Jesus and he's already dead. 
So we know that there was a soldier that took a spear and rammed that spear into the side of Christ. And the Bible says when he rammed that into the side of Christ, the Bible says that out came blood and water. And so some of the commentaries will say that that's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross of Calvary. That because blood and water came out of the side of Christ, that is a witness that he's the son of God. The more I read about that when I thought, well, there's a problem. The spirit isn't mentioned anywhere in that. This says the spirit and the water and the blood. Secondly, when you read about that explanation over there in the Gospel of John, the explanation says blood and water came out. This is water and blood. I, I think the order is important. And so I don't think it's that. Now, this is Carlson's opinion. I don't think it's that. Because the truth is, if those other two thieves were on the, their crosses and had died already, and somebody had taken a spear and punctured their side, out of their sides also would have come blood and water if they'd already died. So I don't think that it's Calvary because I don't think that in itself is evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. The second thing that some of the commentaries will tell you is no, it's, it's not a reference to Calvary, it's a reference to the ordinances of a church. And so they say water is a picture of water baptism, and they'll say the blood is the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. The only problem is the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, you know, is a body and blood, and where is the spirit in that? And, and I think that's a stretch. I, I, I think that's somebody that's trying to champion the ordinances of a local church. And you say, well, Pastor, you've ruled out two. There's about eight to pick from. And so, you know, the one that to me that's most convincing, and, and whether I've got it right or not, I think the point will be true. There's something that the spirit and the water and the blood about Jesus Christ is a seventh witness of who he is. And could I suggest to you when Jesus Christ was conceived, Mary was told by the angel Gabriel, that which shall be conceived of thee is of the Holy Ghost. Stick with me. If I'm right, the spirit part was the conception of Christ, the beginning of his earthly life. The water is the next thing, and that could have application to water baptism. Jesus' public ministry began with water baptism. And the blood, of course, he shed on the cross of Calvary. The spirit and the water and the blood really encompass the earthly life of Jesus Christ. Now, I say, preacher, I don't agree with that. That's fine. Uh, let's agree just for this morning to disagree. Could I say the seventh witness of who Jesus is is the entire life of Jesus Christ? Remember, soldiers were sent to arrest Christ. And they came back without Christ. And, and they were saying, well, where is he? Their answer was, never man spake like this man. Peter, when he preached over there in Acts chapter 3, the Bible says he went about doing good. I, I'm saying the entire life of Jesus Christ there is no person that's alive today and there's no person that's dead today that could hold a candle up by their life to the life of Jesus Christ. I'm saying the seventh witness of who Jesus is is the entire earthly life of Jesus Christ. Do you know what we've seen this morning? Seven witnesses of who Jesus is. And isn't it amazing? Our Lord was up in heaven in eternity. And he came down to this earth because he loved you and I so much. Folks, that really, that, that, ought, that ought to do something to him. I don't think we can question the love of Jesus. If there's any question, 
it would be the love of us for Jesus. We don't, we don't skeptics might. Well, I don't think he's the son of God. Skeptics might waste their life debating that. Folks, we have too many witnesses. We have more than two or three. I've given you seven that verify who Jesus, there, there is no question or there should be no question in your mind who Jesus is and how much he loved you. If there's any question that's a fair, how much do we love him? Is our life completely consumed with loving Jesus Christ? Or is it true that there are so many other things that steal our attention? I close with this illustration. That there was a young American engineer. He was sent to Ireland. His company sent him to Ireland. And he was to work in a new electronics plant. And he accepted that posting. It was a two-year assignment because of how much extra money it would pay him and he needed that extra money because he wanted to come home and marry his, the love of his life, his girlfriend. Well, she had a job in Tennessee. And so when he went over there to Ireland and she stayed in Tennessee, they were pooling their resources so when they got married, they could buy a house when he returned. And they wrote back and forth. They corresponded during those lonely weeks as they went by. But then she, back in Tennessee, she started having doubts. She started having doubts about this man who said that he loved her so much. And, and so she asked him, she said, how do I know that you're being true to me? He wrote back and he said, listen, he said, you're my sweetheart, you're, you're my love. I'll admit, now here's a statement, I'll admit that I sometimes have thoughts of other girls. But it's never gone beyond a thought. The next envelope that he gets is a letter from her and a harmonica. Now stick with me. And she says, uh, I want you to learn in the rest of these two years how to play the harmonica. So when you get back here to Tennessee, you can play me some of those songs. Well, sure enough, he, he wrote over the next weeks and months, I love you, I love you more than life itself, and you're the love of my life, and there's no one else. Finally, the two years is finished. He flies back to the States, he reports to his office there, and gets a quick flight to Tennessee, and comes off that plane, and she's waiting right there with her family. And he, in his excitement, just heads straight for her, and she holds up her hand. And she says, before we go any further, I want you to prove that you haven't spent time thinking of someone else. Play me some songs that you've learned. Do you know what? It's easy for us to say that we love the Lord Jesus Christ. But the time that's spent thinking of him, talking to him, loving him. You can't make that up. And if that guy had written back to that girl and said, you know, I really do love you, but if he couldn't find middle C on his harmonica, it would all have been stories. There's no question who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. There's no question that he loves us. Do we love him? Let's pray. Father, we spent a lot of time on this word, shows up five times in 1 John. Witnesses, witnesses, witnesses. And Lord, we don't just believe that Jesus is the Son of God because some soul winner told us one day, because a dad or a mom told us, or a preacher told us. We've got seven different witnesses that Jesus is the Son of God. Lord, if there's anybody that's kind of vacillating in their faith, wondering whether Bible Christianity is really any different
than every other religion and every other cult, Lord, the witnesses of Jesus Christ verify who he is. Lord, there's no question that you love us. The practical question, do we love you? Lord, would you help us to love you more than life itself? May you become the love of our life, where every effort, every bit of energy is invested in showing you how much we love you.